Hey there, everyone. Jason here. I'm going to double check on Facebook and YouTube to make sure we are indeed live. You know, the one time we don't check is the one time that it will be not working and then it would just be a disaster. So it looks like we are indeed up. I'll be able to monitor the comments over on the side. Um, so hey there, I'm Jason Logston, and this is an Exploring Sous Vide Deep Dive Show. It's a new format I've been doing where instead of interviewing someone, I'm going to take a cut of meat, a type of vegetable, or another item and dive into how you can sous vide it. It's a deep dive into a specific item, and I'll also answer your questions, get any tips from you, and we can cover it fully from start to finish to make sure you get the most out of your sous vide machine. Uh, and this project is in a partnership with my sous vide time and temperature charts, as well as the Exploring Sous Vide Facebook Messenger bot. You can see all the time and temperature charts at afmeasy.com slash time or afmeasy.com slash sv times. And you can check out the chat bot at afmeasy.com slash sv bot. It's a pretty cool program that helps you answer all of your sous vide questions. So on to the show. Today, we're going to be diving into two more of my favorite items to cook. First is pork ribs, and the second is salmon. Both of them have a wide range of temperatures, and people often get confused about uh, how long to cook them because there is such a wide range, and the temperature really does make such a big difference on um, the final outcome. So we're going to start with sous vide ribs. Since this is a partnership with the chatbot, as the chatbot's if you ask it how to sous vide ribs, it says rich, smoky, and tender. Ribs are such a fantastic food. My favorite combination is probably 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 65 Celsius for around 18 to 24 hours. Um, it's just starting to be shreddable, but it's not to fall apart. Some other popular combinations are 165, uh, which is 74 Celsius for 18 to 24 hours or 16 for 12 hours. And for a chop-like consistency, I generally prefer 140 for one to two days. So a lot of times and temperatures in there. It's a very densely packed uh, paragraph. And I'm excited to kind of dive into the different aspects of that to tell you, uh, just kind of showcase what the differences are there. I'll be monitoring the comments. So if I look around, um, don't uh, don't worry about that. I'm just making sure I get to see who is joining us, like Mr. David LaForce, um, some other people joining us in the comments. Make sure to say hi. Let me know what your preferred uh, sous vide ribs are and any questions yet you have. I have a big list from people asking uh, earlier that I'll be happy to cover. Got Darren Wilson from Firewater Cooking and the podcast joining us there. How's it going, Darren? Uh, David says his go-to is 152 for 24 hours. That is also my go-to. You know, I love the that time uh, or that texture at uh, 150, 152, and then that timing is pretty much pretty much right. And uh, Darren says he got his Hydro Pro Plus before I did. You can see my my new baby on the counter behind me. I decided to spoil myself for uh, my birthday this year, coming up on the 22nd, and I got a uh, the Hydro Pro Plus. I'm uh, from PolyScience. Uh, I watched Darren or uh, uh, Dave uh, Petranzik talk about it enough that I was uh, couldn't uh, couldn't resist getting one for myself. So I'm really excited to dive into uh, experimenting with that. It came about a half hour earlier when I was on a call with, uh, Michael Shardy from the ISVA and he was very jealous, but I haven't been able to, to dive into it yet. So sous vide ribs. I love sous vide ribs. I'm not great at barbecue in general, uh, doing it the traditional manner. I'd done ribs a few times and they always turned out fine, but nothing like what I could get at good rib places. Um, in the area. And for me, in the area has meant Utah and Connecticut, not exactly hubs of, you know, amazing rib making in the US, though there are places uh, smoking with Chris's in uh, Connecticut is amazing. And uh, Bull's Barbecue is also very good. Um, so there was good ribs around, but um, it wasn't like I was growing up in uh, rib country. So I was always disappointed, I can never quite do, um, do what I wanted and turn out really good flavorful ribs that were also nice and tender. And once I got into sous vide, I started to really be able to do that. <laughs> I could make ribs that were just as good as almost every rib place I've ever eaten at. And it took almost no time and energy, which is one of the my favorite parts of doing it. 
So the time and temperature depends a lot on what you're trying to accomplish. And we'll go into the differences between them. And then there's also a few cuts of ribs we'll talk about. And in general, you, they're usually pretty intercha interchangeable. I'll talk about some of the differences in the cuts, but the, the one that is very different is country style ribs. Those are their own beast. They're not really from the rib region necessarily, um, but the other cuts like St. Louis, uh, spare ribs and baby back are pretty similar on a time and temp standpoint in my experience. So as I said, my favorite combo is 150, 152, right around there for um, 18 to 24 hours anything below 154, basically. It's really tender, it's moist, and it's not falling apart like off the bone, has like, some bite to it, but it just melts in the mouth once you start eating it, which is um, just amazing. Looks like we got uh, Mike Lashardi joining us as well. How's it going, Mike? What's your favorite uh, time and temp combo for ribs, Mike? Um, and as I said, some of the other popular combinations are 165 or 176. If you get up um, in the higher temperature zone, what you're doing um, above 154, 155, is you're now starting to really break apart the, um, the collagen, you're starting to break apart the connective tissue, and you're changing the structure of the meat itself. I did a talk about chuck roast, I cooked at a bunch of different temperatures, and the difference between a 150 degree chuck roast and 176 is just stark. You the meat starts to shrivel, it starts to squeeze out a lot more moisture and it really breaks apart. So if you love fall off the bone ribs that just you can't even pick up the rack without them falling off, then you should look at 165 or 176. But if you prefer having a little bit of bite, you like having a little bit of chew to them while still being really moist and really tender, then stay below that 154 line. Um, in for things like pulled pork, if I want a really, really shreddable pulled pork, then I will go above 165, where if you uh, if you stay below, um, you are going to have more of a, um, almost like a, a pork shoulder steak, which is very good in its own right, but it's different than if you're trying to make a pulled pork. But for ribs, I like the 150. Some people like to go lower and um, you can do ribs at you know, 136, 140, whatever your kind of pork chop like temperature is. Uh, if you do it for one to two days, it's gonna tenderize it enough. It's gonna be really flavorful and really good, but it doesn't have that traditional um, rib texture for me. Um, using baby back ribs works a little bit better with that than some of the fattier, more connective um, spare ribs. So people ask, how long does it take to sous vide ribs? And it depends on the temperature, but in general, you're looking at one to two days if you're below 154. Anything above 154, it starts to accelerate that cooking time pretty quickly, um, and you can get it down to 12 or 24 hours. And if you get up to like 180, it can be even less than that because you're hitting more traditional smoker temperatures. And the for almost all sous vide cooks, the longer you're cooking it, it's just the more tender. Um, so if you have more tender ribs, you don't have to worry about cooking it as long. And if it's a little tougher cut or a tougher animal, then you're going to want to go a little bit longer. And as I said, country style ribs are kind of their own thing. They generally take 18 to 36 hours. Um, but they, um, if that's, if you're, um, below, um, 150. If you go above, then it's four to 18 hours. But with country style, you have to be careful because it's kind of like a London broil that they are normally from a specific part of the animal, but not always. And it's more of kind of a, a catch all. So some of the country style isn't necessarily great. Um, so I want to talk about some of the types of pork ribs. Uh, Darren, what's your favorite um, type of rib to cook? You know, the main ones are baby back or back ribs, uh, spare ribs, which are also side ribs. St. Louis ribs, which are really just trimmed down spare ribs, and then the random country style ribs. So I'm curious what Darren's is, and uh, also David and Mike, if you're still here, let us know what your kind of uh, favorite ones to grab are. The differences between them are the baby back are coming from the upper ribs, they're high on the back, and they are um, the same ribs that if you get a bone in pork rib chop, those are the same ribs from baby back ribs. So the meat that's connected to them is the loin meat 
it's less fatty, the ribs are a little bit smaller, and especially if you want that chop-like consistency, then they're a good one to pick because loin meat is normally cooked to a chop-like consistency. Um, if you go too high on the baby backs, you're, they will break down, but they don't have as much um, kind of moisture to them, as much um, good mouthfeel, I think, as the others, because when you get to higher temperatures, you're breaking down the connective tissue, and baby back has less than some of the others. <laughs> Darren says his favorite ribs are beef short ribs, um, which are also amazing. Um, and his wife likes baby back ribs. So that's kind of what goes into baby back ribs. Um, spare ribs are, um, they're from the underbelly, which is, you know, where bacon comes from. Um, the belly of the, the pig is super flavorful. So there's often not as much meat necessarily as the baby backs, but it's um, more it's tougher, it's fattier, which when you break that down means flavor. So you get great bite to it, great flavor. And um, it does really well at 150, 165, that it holds up really well to those temperatures and you don't lose a lot of the moisture. And then St. Louis ribs are basically, you take spare ribs and you trim off a lot of the um, outside of it. And you basically have a rectangle of spare ribs. And that's where, um, why they're a little bit more expensive normally because they're kind of the premium of the spare ribs but um so they're thicker they're meatier um they're really tasty um i like them a lot but spare and st louis are both of some of my favorites uh, mike says he likes baby back though if he's cooking for a crowd he buys spare ribs and have the butcher cut them in half lengthwise so they're smaller more baby back size which makes sense and Darren says he likes the spare ribs for more flavor for pork ribs. And I agree with that. I think the, I think the spare ribs just have a little bit more, more bite to them, a little bit more meatiness, and they have a little bit better flavor. And uh, Mike says he's sorry they didn't answer right away. He's waiting for a red light while he's driving. Don't wreck, Mike. This is not that important to get, to get your feedback. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously your feedback is super important, but you know, it's really not that critical that you, you crash and burn. And Dave LaFour says he's not very particular. He loves anything pork, but he usually ends up with baby back or St. Louis style. And I used to not really know what the difference was, but once I kind of figured out the difference, the spare ribs and St. Louis are kind of my go-tos because they are also less expensive than baby back. And I like the flavor a little bit better. And as I said, the country style ribs, they're not really a specific cut, um, but they are generally the blade end of the loin or the top of the pork shoulder. And those are kind of two different cuts, which is why it's a little hard to decide what you're doing with them. Um, they're a good um, inexpensive cut though a lot of the time and they come both boneless and bone in a lot of times because if they are from the shoulder, they're a little bit fattier, a little more marbled so they can take those higher temperatures a little bit better and will still have good flavor. So if you're looking at doing ribs, the preparation's generally pretty easy. Um, if you want to really clean it up, you can first remove the membrane. There's the membrane along the back of them. Um, you can take that off, trim off any excess fat, especially if you're going to a lower temperature because the if you're cooking at like 140, a lot of the fat isn't gonna break down necessarily. At 150 and especially at the higher temperatures like 165, you will break down a lot of that fat. So it's a little less important than if you're doing like a 72 hour short ribs at uh, medium rare. Someone asked, can I smoke sous vide rib or can I sous vide ribs and then smoke them? This is the um, great um, debate out there, you know, the pre-smoke or the, the post-smoke. Um, most people agree that you can very, very efficiently combine smoking with sous vide. Um, it just comes down to, do you want to smoke first or smoke second? Um, I'm on the uh, Darren Wilson bandwagon and I almost always smoke second when I smoke uh, ribs. A lot of people do like to smoke them first and then bag them um, and then you can sous vide them afterwards. I usually sous vide them, I chill them, and then I reheat them on the smoker or on the grill. So I get a little bit of that, the smoky aroma. I get the, um, I feel like the smoke sticks a little bit better once, um, if you eat it right away, as opposed to putting it in a bag and cooking it for one to two days. So I usually smoke after um, to reheat, but a lot of people do do it ahead of time. The 
the big, uh, Taryn says there is a good book that talks about that. Yes. Uh, the fire water, uh, cooking, uh, cookbook, uh, is great by Darren. It talks a lot about, uh, smoking, combining smoke and grilling with uh, sous vide. It's a great book that you should definitely check out on Amazon. And I'm sure he has a link he can drop in the comments. Um, my dog is over here uh, co-hosting with me right now, which I always appreciate. A very, very helpful co-host. Um, the most important thing to remember, regardless of when you smoke or of how you reheat your food, if you chill it or if you do any other preparation to sous vide food, the thing to keep in mind is that you don't want the temperature to go above the sous vide temperature. I've had people talk about how tough their meat was because they sous vide it at a low temperature for a long period of time to tenderize it, and they smoked it or they threw it under the broiler for a long time, and that raised the temperature and undid almost all of the benefit of using the sous vide process. So if you're cooking your ribs at 150 or 152, then you want to chill them down, and when you reheat them, when you whether that's on the grill or smoking them or under the broiler, you don't want the temperature of them to go above 150. Otherwise, you're going to squeeze out all that moisture that you tried so hard with sous vide to save. And similar, in a similar manner, I can't say the word simul similarly ever. I have no idea why I cannot say that word. Um, so in a similar manner... If you smoke first, you don't want to smoke them to a temperature above 150 if that's your go-to sous vide temperature. And uh, Mike says, Otto just want ribs. He wants loving more than ribs, but he would probably settle for ribs if I had some on hand right now. Um, so that's kind of how you can combine smoking with sous vide anything, but specifically ribs work really well um, and reheating them on the grill. Um, people ask about, can you do a good barbecue ribs sous vide? And the answer is, yeah, I do the same method. I sous vide them at 150, I chill them down, and then I reheat them on the grill with a good barbecue sauce on them. I do a sous vide brisket recipe with it, and I think I have some um, images here that I can probably show how that works. Yeah, so got some rib shots here. Let me pull up the the right window with them. So I'll usually season my ribs ahead of time. Um, people are always up in arms about whether you should add seasoning to your meat before you sous vide it because um, it doesn't penetrate because of all these reasons, um, which I get, but I eat the outside of my, my food, so I don't care if it penetrates. I think it coats it a little bit better. Um, and you don't get quite as strong of a flavor a lot of the time. And so I'll often reapply some of the rub at the end. I put on a salt and um, seasoning rub, uh, bag it up. If I'm not using, um, if I have a, my big sealers, um, I can use uh, full racks almost, but uh, if I'm using my chamber back, I can't always put it in a full rack. So I'll uh, cut it up into smaller pieces. There's nothing wrong with that. And uh, most people don't need an entire rack on their plate to, to start with. But once it's done, like I said, I'll chill it and I'll throw it on the grill. You can either smoke it, um, you can put on a barbecue sauce and flip it um, to kind of get that caramelization. And that's how I'll do barbecue ribs with it. Um, a nice sugar heavy sauce will um, coat it and give it some um, good caramelization on the outside and some great flavor that you can uh, really enjoy. And I'll almost always just cut them off the bone and serve them, um, you know, for people to, uh, that was a huge picture, um, for people to see it a little easier. There we go. That looks a little more appealing. Nothing looks good at like 100 times magnification. So that's how I generally do ribs and how I will seal them. Um, Mike says he's got his grandma's family recipe ribs and barbecue sauce um, in the Champions of Sous Vide book. Um, it's uh, He was really excited to be able to publish that, you know, one of his uh, grandma's family recipes. And uh, it's a great book. A lot of other people are in there. We got uh, Darren Wilson had some recipes, James Prichione, uh, a bunch of our contributing members at the ISVA, which is always great to see. Uh, people also ask, can you sous vide um, frozen ribs? And the answer is sure. I do that all the time. Um, I throw them in the... Um, in the sous vide machine, if they've already been bagged, um, if I've bagged them, I don't see, do them in um, packaging that 
I didn't do because I want to season them and put salt on them, use my own packaging, and then I just throw them in direct from the freezer. We're talking about a uh, one to two days, you know, cook time at most temperatures and the extra hour or I mean, ribs aren't that thick. Usually half hour, maybe it takes to heat from frozen um, is it's so small that it doesn't really affect the cook time in any way. So you don't have to worry about it or some other things. It really can affect it, especially like salmon or some of the quicker cooking um, items. And we'll get to the salmon in a few minutes. And uh, People ask, how can you pre-cook ribs with sous vide? And it's the same process. You know, I talk about once you've sous vide it, cooling it down uh, to chill it and then reheating it on the smoker or on the grill or in the oven is great this time of year. Um, you don't have to do that step right away. If I'm having a party over on the weekend, remember when we could actually have parties on the weekend and have friends over and hang out? Uh, when I would do that, I would sous vide all my my ribs or brisket or whatever I was going to make for the party on like Tuesday or Wednesday. Chill it down, have it in the fridge, ready to go. When people start showing up, I would then pull it out, uh, let it heat at room temperature for a little bit till I was ready to grill it, and I'd throw it on the grill to reheat it. So it'd be days and days later. Um, and as long as you chill it properly, it is safe to do that because you've cooked it long enough to pasteurize it. So it's a great way to kind of use sous vide to meal plan ahead of time and especially party plan ahead of time. And if I, like I said, if it's this time of year, I'll finish ribs in the oven a lot. It's a great way to finish, um, finish ribs, finish meat, especially if you've chilled it a little bit, it can go a little bit longer. You get that crust if it's under the broiler. And I think it was Chef Steps maybe that has a great um, non-smoker smoked ribs and uh, brisket recipe that they use a lot of, I believe it's uh, ancho chili powder, chipotle chili powder, some of those that have um, more smoky flavor to them, smoked paprika. They use that as the rub, sous vide it, finish it under the oven, and it has a lot of those smoky notes that you would expect from um, a traditional, um, traditional smoked uh, ribs. You know, nothing's going to replicate that the smoke ring and those long cook smoke times, but you get really, really close to um, what really good ribs taste like. And it's a lot less work than going out there um, to smoke them, you know, traditionally. There's nothing wrong with smoking them traditionally, but I feel like that is a, you know, I'm excited for a project today versus I want to eat after a long work day. Uh, Darren says you can also do Cadillac cut ribs where you can sous vide them, chill them, Cut them close to the bone on two sides and make a rib with a big amount of meat on each side. Oh, that sounds great. So um, he says they're great for parties. So it comes down to, you know, when you take this, this entire rack, there's lots of different ways that you can trim those down. And so what he's saying, instead of cutting down the middle of each one, you can make sure that pretty much every other rib you just discard. And um, that leaves every other rib with a ton of meat on either one as uh, must be a super impressive presentation. And that would be a great thing to do for parties. So as always, let me know if you have any comments in the or any questions in the comments. Um, it's always good, happy to answer whatever people have. And um, if not, I will move on to salmon, which is the next exciting piece. One of my favorite things to do um, just in general. And it's one of those ones that I think sous vide has its place. Um, as I said, this is a partnership with the, uh, the Exploring Sous Vide chatbot. So let's see what the chatbot says about salmon. Um, it says it's normally cooked between 104 Fahrenheit and 140 Fahrenheit, which is 40 to 60 Celsius, which ranges from just slightly warm texture up to firm and even chewy at the high end. The fish only has to be cooked long enough to heat it through thoroughly, which is usually 25 to 45 minutes. And brining the fish before cooking it helps to firm up the texture and flavor it. So again, a wide range of temperatures. And I posted in Exploring Sous Vide, I said, you know, what's your experience with salmon? And we had someone that said, I cooked it and I hated it. And uh, Darren and I uh, dug in and said, you know, what, what did you cook it at? And he said 100 Fahrenheit <laughs> uh, for an hour. And it's like, you're not cooking it at that temperature. It, you're warming the meat, basically. And it's very good, but it's like warm sushi. Uh, it's not <laughs> like pan fried salmon in any way whatsoever. You're not going to confuse those. And so it's one that people often run into trouble with because there is a wide range um, of temperatures because there's a wide range of uses for salmon. So I want to dive into why sous vide it and then some of the, the process that goes into it. 
Uh, Mike says he loves high-low salmon, which is when you cook it at a high temperature, like 183 for four minutes, and then you can cut it down to uh, 125 for 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, Dave Petranzik shared that at the ISVA summit uh, two years ago when we had our first one, um, and we're currently in planning for our virtual summit that's showing up in August. We have a lot of great speakers already starting to be lined up. We're going to do a slightly different format this year, which we think is going to run even more smoothly, have some exciting things like some lightning talks to highlight some of our established speakers. And we're going to be doing some a little more demo heavy to bring in some new speakers um, that haven't been exposed to our audience and hopefully have some really cool, interesting things. Uh, tickets will be going on sale for that in uh, a few weeks once uh, once we kind of finalize the details. It should be a really, really fun time. So why would you sous vide salmon? You know, Why would you sous vide something you can throw on a pan, sear it for a few minutes per side, and then you eat it, right? That's a question a lot of people have. To me, the biggest benefit is you get the exact temperature, and that's because salmon changes drastically over a pretty narrow temperature range. So using sous vide allows you to hit kind of different temperatures exactly how you want. I also think it's great for poached salmon. If you want to replicate a poached or steamed type of salmon, it's amazing. If you want to replicate a like a seared salmon, you know, it's not nearly as good. If you want to do something like like this one that has a nice crust on it, um, it's a lot harder to do with um, sous vide than some of the more tender preparations that we'll get into. So what are the steps for sous vide salmon? Um, I'll give you an overview and then we can dive into each one. Um, it's pretty simple, but you just wanna prep the salmon, you wanna salt it, um, either using a dry brine or a wet brine. For a lot of things, that's not too important, but for salmon and other fish, it does make a big difference. You know, I'm all about saving as much time as you can. I always brine my fish, um, probably 95% of the time, because it does make a drastic difference. You want to lightly seal it. You usually don't want a hard seal on fish, or you're going to crush it. You're going to change the texture and the consistency of, of the fish. And, um, you only have to cook it uh, until it's heated through. Salmon and fish are very tender. You don't want them to fall, uh, to uh, get mushy, which happens pretty quickly. So you just want to heat it through. You know, as I say, you have 30 to 50% kind of cook time, but if you're looking at 30 to 40 minutes for salmon, you only have another 10 to 20 before the texture really starts to degrade. And then you can sear it if you want, um, which for some salmon preparations, you definitely want to sear. And for several others, you definitely don't want to sear. So it depends what you're trying to accomplish. So what is that preparation? Um, oh, Mike says, uh, following the comments here. Oh, David LaFour says, do you chill it um, in between when you do the high low? And you generally don't just, uh, you have to cool your um, water bath to get it to the lower temperature unless you have two of them, but um, you don't have to chill the salmon in between. Um, and I'll get into the high low a little bit, but it's a really interesting um, uh, method, way to do it. So the preparation is pretty easy. You prepare it like you generally would. Remove the pin bones. If you're not going to eat the skin, um, you can either remove it now or it's a lot easier to remove after it's been cooked. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of chefs out there that have no problem. I remember watching Barry's demo at our <laughs> sous vide showcase. Um, we do a sous vide showcase every month and uh, Barry Tonkinson from the Institute of Culinary Education just took an entire side of fish and was like, you just remove the skin and just took it off in about five seconds. It would have taken me 45 minutes and I would have had huge pieces of flesh missing, but chefs are really good at removing the skin. I'm not too good. So I leave it on and remove it at the end. Um, I also eat my skin and my wife doesn't. So I'm just removing skin from one of them normally. And if you're going to portion your salmon, it's generally better to portion it while it's raw because it's gonna be very tender, very kind of break apart um, once you've cooked it. I have a good shot of me trying to portion afterwards and you can see kind of it's not clean lines it's pretty jagged and there's smushiness <laughs> going on there it's not the most um, appetizing of preparations there at the end so doing the brine step 
a lot of people picture brining as being a huge hassle. You know, we think of like brining a turkey or brining pork that you, you know, make a brine on the stove with a salt and water mixture, cool it down, uh, need a big pot, throw in an entire turkey to brine it. With fish, it's a lot easier. You can do a wet brine, which is pretty easy. It's basically um, five percent salt to water. Um, so it's like four cups of water and a quarter cup of salt. You heat it up chill it before you put the salmon in it um, and let the salmon sit for like 10 to 15 minutes. Not that hard to do. You don't need giant pots to accomplish that. Um, but I almost always do a dry brine. I like the texture a little bit better. You're not introducing moisture moisture into the, the salmon, which it's all going to be moist and tender already. You don't need much more. And it firms up the outside a little bit, which I like a little firmer texture on my salmon. So that's a good thing for me. So the, the brine does firm up the flesh, which makes it a little, um, have a little more bite to it, a little less buttery, but it's still going to have um, great texture. So that's one benefit. And the other is you reduce the albumin, the white stuff that comes out of the salmon that kind of congeals on the outside. It looks very unappetizing. The brine will reduce that from happening a lot, which is another big benefit for presentation. As I said, I always do dry brine because I'm lazy. I don't want to do a wet brine, but I do take the 30 minutes to do a uh, dry brine. You just salt it, put it in the bag, let it sit for maybe 30 minutes, and then you are good to go. Uh, Darren says he cooked the crispy skin salmon in the Innova oven last week that Scott uh, Heimendinger has in there. He says it was awesome. Uh, what was the time and temperature for the meat? Was that 122 for... Uh, about 30 minutes and then you crisp up the skin, I think is what I had seen there. Well, let's see when Darren hops back with that. Um, seasoning salmon, you can season it ahead of time. It's not that long of a cook and you don't want to overpower the salmon. So uh, I'll do light seasoning occasionally, um, but you do want to add oil to the pouch if there are multiple portions. I know if you are <laughs> watching this on Facebook, you're probably in Facebook groups like the my Exploring Sous Vide group. And you know if you put butter in a pouch with steak, you're going to get yelled at by 50 random people <laughs> in the group. But when it comes to fish, the oil isn't a bad thing. And it also helps keep the pieces of meat separated. If you go through the effort of portioning your salmon, put it into a bag without oil and sous vide it, they are going to stick together really, really well. Um, so it's going to be um, one big piece of salmon that's even less uh, kind of holding together. We're adding the oil, it'll stay separate and it's a little bit easier to move. And you can also butter or fat, po fat poach salmon really easily. You don't need you know, a tub of butter or a tub of fat, put a little bit in the bag and it's gonna add a lot of that great flavor to it. And you can also do one of the really cool things I saw, which I call the control freak method. I went to Star Chefs and they had a demo there that what they do is they make a vast quantity of chili pepper infused oil. So they take like a canola oil or a grapeseed, one of the more neutral oils, they infuse it with a ton of chili pepper uh, flavoring. And they do this, They in the restaurant, they make five or six different blends of this. And then they fill up a pot with that oil on a control freak, which maintains precision temperature um, in a pot. And then they put in salmon in there and they poach the salmon at, I think they did 130. And that was probably the best piece of salmon I had ever had. Here's Aura King Salmon. They were a sponsor of Chef St or of Star Chefs and poached in that smoky uh, chili-infused oil. It was to die for. It was just amazing, amazing poached salmon. So that's another method if you um, you know want to do something a little fancier, if you're cooking um, especially a lot of uh, salmon for a crowd, like that's a great way that you're not uh, using a lot of oil necessarily, but it was a great way to add it. And Mike wants to know, duck fat poached with the control freak. That would be an interesting uh, combination. I'm not, uh, we need to ask James Bruchione on the flavor pairing between uh, salmon and duck, but um, I'm sure Mike would uh, enjoy that. You can never have too much duck fat. <laughs> and people always ask, how do, how do you seal salmon for sous vide? You know, a weak seal is fine. Um, but otherwise you're going to crush it and you're going to change the texture and you're going to smush it. And, there are reasons you might want to do that, but if you don't know the reasons why and you're not trying to do that, then <laughs> don't do that. 
either use a light seal or just water displacement. That's what I do. I almost always just do a simple water displacement. You know, I'll toss it in the bag um, and I'll throw it in the water bath and just leave it draped over the top. That's an easy way to do it. And you can kind of see the amount of salt that I use for a dry brine. You don't need a ton. I don't know why half of the images are, um, are in there. You don't need a ton, but you do want it, you know, heavier than you would with a normal kind of salting. Um, and it works really well. So let's dive into the temperatures. Um, oh, Kevin says it definitely needs to be chilled before vacuum sealing. And that's a great point. If you're doing something that you do need to vacuum seal it for whatever reason, you can, you know, chill it or, you know, throw it in the freezer for five or 10 minutes to kind of firm up the outside and you can get a little harder seal on it at that point. Um, it's not something I do very often because I don't do fancy preparations, um, but that is a great option for, um, lightly chilling something so you get a little uh, firmer texture so you can seal it. Uh, thanks, Kev. Um, so let's dive into temperatures. What are the salmon temperatures here? And this is where all that confusion comes in because um, it depends what you're trying to do. So the first, I kind of have tent poles. That's how I like to do everything that where does the texture really start to change? So when I say we, we're going to start with 104, um, if you say I've been told, you know, 102 or 106, it's the same thing. Like the texture is going to be close enough that unless it's side by side, you're not going to be able to tell. And even if it is side by side, a lot of times you won't be able to tell. So take these as general guidelines. The first is 104, and that is the Miqui salmon. It's like warm sushi. It's almost the exact same texture as um, normal raw salmon. It's just warm. It's firmed up a tad. Um, it's released some of the aromas and flavors, but it's almost the exact same. You can see here, this is at, uh, I believe that's 104, and it's it looks like raw salmon, and it basically tastes like warm raw salmon, which I is an interesting flavor, and it's really good, but it's if you're not expecting it, like the one person that commented on doing, if you're expecting pan-seared salmon and you cook it at 104, you're going to be horribly disappointed because the texture is raw texture. If you did this with an entire filet and put it on someone's plate, it's it's going to be a lot. It's just going to be a lot. There's a reason why you serve it with just a few things here. Uh, and I don't know if Richard Jensen's listening, um, but I know he does his, his modernist cooking. You can see back here is a, I believe that's a rosemary tarragon infused cream that I used in the whipping siphon um, for a, a nice flavored uh, mousse to put on um, with the capers and the the lightly cured uh, cooked warm salmon. Um, there is a fun fun dish to experiment with. Um, going up from there is 110. That's the next one that it's starting to firm up slightly. It doesn't taste like sushi anymore. It doesn't taste like flaky salmon at all, but it is firmed up some. It's just started really cooking. And I like to think of it as like cured flaky grav locks or locks almost. Um, so here's one that I did that I um, I cured this first um, for a day or two in the bag. So it was a citrus cure. And <laughs> Richard said he is lurking while he's on a work call. I won't tell your boss, don't worry. <laughs> um, so I took some salmon, I cured it for a day or two with some citrus, some sugar and some salt. Um, and then I sous vide it at 110 for probably 30, 40 minutes, just that it was heated through. Then I chilled it in the bag. Then I cut it um, once it was chilled. And it was firm. Um, you know, it's not the same thing as Gravlox or Lox, but it is has really good texture, really good flavor, and a cold preparation. Um, it was a great way to serve it. I did it with um, some thinly sliced um, fennel car carpaccio and some quick pickled red onions and a few capers and some dill. Uh, turned out really well, and I was a big fan of this dish. And it's a great, um, a great showcase of like these last two dishes. You don't want to sear, right? And it makes it perfect for sous vide. There's almost no finishing step here because you want those very delicate, tender textures um, kind of going around. The next kind of tent pole is 120. That's we're up to like 49 Celsius. And the fish is starting to flake. It's resemb resembling a really soft poach at this point. You can see here this dish I did. Um, you'll recognize the 
um, horribly portioned uh, salmon from earlier. I thought I managed to hide most of the lines pretty well, so it still looked pretty. Um, but you can see that it's not flaky. You know, it's not falling apart. It's not that kind of cooked, um, uh, traditionally cooked texture, but it is coming together. This doesn't look like raw salmon anymore. It is starting to fall apart a little bit. And here I served it with, I think it was a cucumber and tomato and fennel um, tossing there, which um, worked out pretty good. So it's like soft poach, though it's moist, it's butter-like. Like you don't want an entire filet of this because it's going to be overwhelmingly rich. But serving it with some bright, uh, crunchy, uh, flavorful um, uh, sides like this is a great way to kind of highlight that. Mike says I need to demo the 101 one for the uh, 110 degree one for the sous vide showcase. I am down for doing that. Uh, remind me, Mike, I will do that. That'd be a great one. Um, and some of the salmon ones, uh, Mike and I have been talking about doing some hands-on cooking classes. I've been doing some on Chibo, which um, has worked pretty good. Richard and Mike have tuned in for those. Um, but Mike and I thought it might be fun to do some for the ISVA that we can do some hands-on free cooking classes. Um, we can all jump on, uh, do StreamYard. Um, I'll be standing over in my kitchen instead of here and we can send out the recipes ahead of time. Uh, maybe we'll do one of these uh, salmon ones because um, it's a quick cooking time. That'd be great for a, uh, a good hands-on class. The 121 is really good and really flavorful, uh, especially if you can get some fresh vegetables, um, which isn't the best time of year right now, but it is, um, um, could be something fun to do. So at this point, you probably don't want to sear any of these. You don't really want to do much to them because they are, you know, a soft steam, a soft poach, warm sashimi. Um, you're looking for that really texture buttery flavor. Um, and now we're going to move into like the 132. Um, this is really starting to firm up, but it's getting flaky. It's the proteins are changing. You can see that it's looking a lot more done now than, than a lot of the other ones. Um, this is not seared. You can finish it off with a sear, um, and I'll show you a picture of that, but you can kind of see how the texture has changed and it really looks like cooked salmon, like a cooked poach. Here, I'm serving it with a jalapeno. Uh, I forget all, what all was in this. There's, I think, jalapeno. Um, uh, lemon cucumber and uh, sour apple um, uh, tossed with a uh, just a vinaigrette. Um, and it was really flavorful, bright. Here is an appetizer for a um, spring kind of meal. And if you end up searing that, you get more of a decent crust on it, but the inside still that really fall apart, moist, tender. And finally, you can do the 140, and that is flaky. It's you know, like the inside of a pan fried salmon, it's much drier at that point. Um, I prefer the 132 if I'm going to be doing a more traditional preparation. Um, the 140 is a little too dry for me, but it's still pretty good. And what a lot of people would consider um, how they probably pan fry salmon. Um, I tend to pull my salmon out when I'm pan frying at about 120 because um, you get the nice crust on the outside, but the inside still nice and moist. So, those are kind of the salmon temperatures. If you're doing um, uh, equilibrium cooking, um, low, low cooking, there's lots of names that some of the people in the chat I'm sure are familiar with as we've talked about the things that aren't just throwing it in a bath. So this is if you put it in the bath. The other one is if you want to do um, high, low cooking or delta T cooking, um, some of those methods. Doing the high-low cooking is something Dave Petranzik showed us from PolyScience at our last seminar. He likes doing his salmon at 180. He does it for one to two minutes, then he drops it into a lower temperature bath. Mike was saying this is what he does. And at the 180, it firms up that outside. So that outer layer is overcooked, if you will. But for the American palate, we often like having food that has firmer texture on the outside. There's a reason that we like to sear um, pretty much everything. And even using a torch a lot of the times isn't giving you right that crust that you would from like a cast iron pan, but it's still firming it up and we still like that firmness to it. So that high low is a great way to kind of add more texture, a little more nuance to the dish without really having to do too much more effort. So just crank your bath up to 170, 180, throw the salmon in for a few minutes and then take the salmon out, throw some ice into your bath to 
drop that temperature down to, you know, 120, 130, 140, whatever you prefer, then you can put the salmon in there to finish coming up to temperature. And I know Dave does this with a probe. That's the most accurate way to do it. And if you don't have a probe or a fancy new hydro pro like I do, <laughs> um, then the exact timing isn't too critical because you are going to be cooking at the lower temperature. So one or two minutes at high and then throw it in what you want and just do it another 20 to 30 minutes and you should be good to go in the majority of the cases. Kevin says um, 180 also pasteurizes the fish on the outside almost instantly, which is a great point. Um, everything we are talking about here, um, you're probably not going to kill everything in the fish, you know, um, and that's true of sous vide and of traditional methods. So it's one thing, you know, we think about, you know, safety in a lot of cases with fish. You should be using fresh fish. You should be cooking it and handling it in a responsible way because it is hard to pasteurize fish and make it still taste really, really good because the temperatures needed to pasteurize things are above what you generally want to cook fish. Or if you cook your salmon to 130 and hold it there for an extra hour to an hour and a half, like you could with a steak or um, pork tenderloin, your salmon is going to be pretty mushy. So I know there are preparations that you can do. Um, I think Crea uses sous vide um, salmon. They cook at 140 or 150 until it's pasteurized and they chill it and then they flake it and they serve it as a chilled uh, salmon for salad, right? It's going to be overcooked compared to like a salmon filet that you would want. But in a salad, it's going to have really good texture, uh, really good flavor, and it is pasteurized. But most of the time, you're not going to pasteurize fish. So eat good fish that you would generally feel comfortable eating raw. That's that's my advice. I am not a fishmonger, though, and I don't work for the health department. But <laughs> uh, and as I said, with the, the timing, you just need to cook it long enough to heat it through, regardless of the temperature. You just want to heat it through with for um, like a half inch is about 15 minutes. An inch is about 35 minutes and an inch and a half is like an hour and 25 minutes. And at that point, I'd honestly recommend uh, set the bath two degrees higher and uh, that will knock 30% off the cooking time. So you're not turning the outside of your salmon into um, a not ideal texture, right? Uh, an hour and a half for salmon is a pretty long time. Um, so I would, I would do... Um, if you wanted your salmon to be uh, 130 degrees, I would set the bath to 132 and I would, instead of an hour and a half, I would cook it for an hour and the inside is going to be the temperature you want, but you're not going to be cooking it for as long. And Kevin says sushi grade fish is frozen um, to eliminate parasites, which is very true. Um, and that's one thing, know what you're eating and there's a lot of variety in fish and where you get it from. So um, just be comfortable with what you're doing. Uh, searing after sous vide with salmon is a big question I get, a big complaint. How do you do it? How does it work? And it's hard. <laughs> uh, as I said, there's a lot of preparations that you don't need it for. And I usually do salmon when I don't need a sear um, finishing step. I like, um, if I really want a good crust on my salmon, I will usually just pan fry it. You know, it's not hard. And I write about sous vide. I'm president of the International Sous Vide Association. I don't use sous vide for everything every time. Um, so salmon's one of those. If I want the um, lower temperature salmon or if I want poached salmon, I always use sous vide because it's so much easier to do. But if I want a good hard crust on it, I don't. That said, uh, Chelsea Cole was on the Exploring Sous Vide show yesterday. Um, you should tune into those episodes. We have great discussion with the guests. Um, we have some amazing guests coming up. I'm super excited for the rest of the month. It's going to be really cool. We have the uh, beverage director for the Institute of Culinary Education coming on. We have the culinary director for the Institute of Culinary Education. They both came to us um, through separate paths, <laughs> but um, they are both coming on in the next month. Um, some amazing guests that I'm really looking forward to uh, learning from their expertise. Um, so if I do want to sear and I want um, after sous vide, um, I'll do something similar to what Chelsea Cole recommended. She likes having a good Parmesan crust, I believe she said, on her salmon. So she cooks it to 122. She lets it chill slightly. She puts the crust on, puts it under the broiler on the oven, and cooks it long enough to get that crust. And the inside temperature is going to raise up some, but she cooked it lower than she wants to eat it at. And so that raising of the temperature is fine. And she's got her technique down. It works well. 
Another issue people run into with searing is how do you get it out of the bag, right? You cook a chuck roast or a, a ribeye, you cut the top off the bag, you reach in, you grab the meat and <laughs> you move on with your life. If you do that with salmon, you're gonna have a, a handful of salmon and the other half's gonna be in the bag. It's very delicate, it's very tender, regardless of the temperature pretty much. So the easiest way that I've seen if you really struggle is to cut it out of the bag, put the bag down on a cutting board, cut around it, take off the top of the bag, and then you can use a spatula to remove the salmon and just be very delicate with it when you're using paper towels to dry it off. Um, that's the easiest way to generally do it, um, but use a spatula. Um, it's gonna make your life a lot easier and be very careful with it because it is gonna try to fall apart. Um, and you can also use a torch. I use a torch for fish a lot just to give it some color, give it a little bit of firmness to the texture. And it's you're not adding a, a crunchy layer or anything, but you are adding some good color and it kind of makes it look a little more plate appealing at that point. And as I said, with a citrus cured salmon, my finishing step was to chill it. You know, a lot of these salmons, you can cook it to change the texture. You can chill it and you can serve it cold. And it's great on, you know, cheese plates, on cartoucherie platters. It's a great kind of appetizer to serve, um, especially during spring or summer, that you can add these great buttery flavor without needing um, an entire fish in front of someone. And like everything, can you sous vide frozen salmon? By now, everyone should know. Yes, you know you can you can sous vide frozen pretty much everything. With salmon, it's a little trickier because you don't want to go too long on those cooking times. So you want to be a little more exact um, at the end of your cooking. Once it's heated through, it should be about thirty to fifty percent longer if it's frozen. You want to pull it out. You've used your leeway already, so don't don't go too long afterwards. Mike says on the searing um, of salmon, the advice Dave Petransic gave him was lots of oil in the pan and get it really hot. Um, and that works well to crisp up the skin. And that's a great idea is um, using a lot of oil, you know, we tend not to do it, but if you're trying to do a delicate thing that you want to cook very quickly, a lot of oil is a great way to do it. Because when you add something to those pans, the temperature drops and the more oil, the more uh, energy that it's going to hold and the quicker it's going to sear. Um, and if you cook skin side down and present skin side up, that's a good way to um, have a good crunchy layer without um, really having to cook both sides of it and minimize the amount of time that it's cooking. Uh, Kevin asks, um, have you ever done whole fish sous vide? I have not, but um, I can pull up a link here. I think sous vide Supreme honestly just did this. Um, and I saved the link. So I was like, that looks really cool. They did a Chinese style whole fish sous vide. Um, I'll post the link in the chat. It just came through. Um, they have a beautiful preparation on it. And what they did was they did it at 130 um, in a gallon size Ziploc um, pouch. Um, that looks about it. They put some uh, julienne, ginger, scallion, and cilantro in the cavity of the fish and on its surface, and then they vacuum sealed it and cooked it for an hour. So they were using, um, they used whole white fish is what they called for. So looks like a great preparation method, um, not something that I have done. I am don't know fish well enough that I'm not good at breaking it apart when it's on the, on the scales. It's probably something that I should put in my uh, to to learn repertoire, but um, I know you're a huge um, fisherman. So I think that's something that uh, I feel like you should experiment with that or you and Lloyd can go on a fishing trip and come back with the best way to uh, sous vide a, a whole fish. <laughs> and uh, the last thing people ask is like, can you reheat or cook sous vide salmon ahead of time? And it's like, if you're doing one of those cold preparations, definitely, you know, cook it, chill it, use it in a day or two because it's not going to be pasteurized. Um, so you don't want to leave it in the fridge for too long, but you can definitely do that ahead of time. But if you're serving it warm, I mean, it cooks so fast, there's not much benefit to it. It's better to sous vide it fresh um, right before you do it because
Hey, I'm back. <laughs> um, not sure why I died there. My computer has been acting up lately. It's the second time during live shows that it has died. So, um, <laughs> um, as I was saying, uh, don't, um, I would not re I would not sous vide salmon, chill it and then reheat it. Um, just because it does it so fast to start with. So just do it, uh, do it fresh every time. And what we just talked about works for almost all types of salmon. There is definitely a difference between types, you know, king salmon and, you know, farm raised <laughs> salmon aren't, uh, aren't even the same thing, <laughs> you know, from a flavor perspective, but a lot of the times and temperatures and the texture changes will apply while you're doing, you know, king salmon, sockeye, coho, pink, you know, chum. Um, there's differences between them and certain ones will work better with certain methods, but it's not something to stress about from a time and temperature perspective. So that's what I got. Um, I appreciate you all joining me. Um, as I said, this is a partnership with my sous vide time and temperature charts, as well as the exploring sous vide Facebook messenger bot. Uh, check out the time and temperature charts at afmeasy.com slash svtimes and check out the chat bot at afmeasy.com slash svbot. It's uh, something that I developed. I'm very excited about it. People that use it seem to like it, um, but give it a shot. Uh, ask it how to sous vide a few different things and give me some feedback on it because we're trying to improve it and make it better. And, you know, it'd be nice to have something that cuts down on the, um, the people going to the Facebook group and saying, how do I sous vide chuck roast? They can go to the bot, ask the same thing, and it will take them to dedicated time of temperatures, recipes, and guides that, you know, I created myself that are vetted by the sous vide community, um, both from people I respect looking at it and people that, you know, I might not respect looking at it and giving me a hard time about it. So um, I appreciate all you tuning in and, um, it was great chatting as always. I'll see you all next Thursday for the Exploring Sous Vide show. Make sure you check in on that and uh, look forward to hanging out with all of you. See y'all later.